It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 248 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 20th of November, 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And on the show today, we take a look at the subsurface ocean on Pluto and finding antibiotics in our guts. But first, narwhals. <laughs> if that was funny, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Just the way you said it. <laughs> and now we're going to find narwhals in our guts. <laughs> Only if you're very, very unlucky. Yeah, pointy. If you asked a mermaid to draw a unicorn, they'd probably draw a narwhal if they existed. Mermaids, that is. Narwhals exist. (laughs) I didn't do that intro very well. Let's just move right past that. (laughs) Narwhals, they're whales, but with two teeth. And on the males, one of those teeth is really long. Sticks out like a horn. And a new study published this week looks at how they navigate under sea ice in the Arctic. And Penny, they use a a high-resolution echolocation. Is that right? That's right. And you might be thinking, why is this a story? We know that um, sea animals do this. But narwhals seem to do it a little bit differently to others. So they live in the Arctic, so sort of off um, Greenland and up in the north of Canada, and it's more dark and there's a lot of ice over the open sea, but it can find the cracks in the ice to breathe. It can hunt for squid. It dives more than a mile down into pitch black water to find its fish. So its mm. echolocation or its, um, is pretty amazing. So unlike uh, studying a whale like a humpback whale where the song goes really widely and you can hear it a long distance away, you have to get up quite close. And I think what I really thought was interesting about this study was the conditions that they're doing it in. And if you think about people researching this in pitch black in the Arctic with ice, (laughs) it's not an easy kind of thing to do. So what the the narwhal can do is it can produce clicks up to 1,000 clicks a second, which we can't hear. That's a lot of clicks. That's a lot of clicks, 1,000 a second. (laughs) And it can be really, really focused. So the narwhal can actually narrow its beam um, to focus at certain distances and it can then widen it as it gets closer to its prey to track it with, um, find out where it is in more detail. So. Did, did it, I thought it said somewhere that they use their head like a lens and the, the shape of their head somehow can channel yeah, it. Yeah, their head. They have a, um, an organ called a melon, I believe, in the head, <laughs> which. <laughs> 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 Are you sure? <laughs> oh, can I consult yeah. my friend? <laughs> Did you just hear a doctor saying, and they channel it through their melon? And- their melon. <laughs> yes. They, they do have an organ called a melon. <laughs> I don't know. I was feeling very confident. <laughs> well, no, all, all whales and um, porpoises and stuff have this melon. <laughs> <laughs> which they use to kind of um, like focus the sound. And apparently they pick it up, um, they pick up the returned beam with uh, fatty tissues in their lips, which is quite interesting. Okay. <laughs> that is so bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be honest, I, know I shouldn't confess this, but until a couple of years ago, I thought narwhals were made up creatures. You know, I can totally understand that mm. because they are quite rare and you hardly ever seen them. If it weren't for the fact that I've seen photos of them that, I would think, yeah, they're probably either like extinct pl- or made up. I definitely so. never seen them around here. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a bit too warm for them down here. Yeah. Um, but in this New York Times article, there is a really cool aerial photo uh, mm. where you can just see uh, an owl in this little lake <laughs> In, amongst the sea ice, it's it's very cool and a good photo. Well, I guess it would be cool. Uh, but there we go. High-resolution echolocation through their melon. Yeah. Very impressive. Which they receive back through their mouth. What the? <laughs> <That's just bizarre. laughs> yeah. 
if ever there were an argument against intelligent design, uh, surely that's it. <laughs> well, but given how the perfect the eyes that is, and it must have been created by a creator, you'd think they just have better eyes and they wouldn't have to use echolocation. Just to see in the dark. Yeah. Lips. Yeah. True, true. Nice one, Ken Ham. All right. <laughs> Shane, we are used to sifting through soil bacteria and exploring remote caves to find new antibiotics, which are basically chemicals used by different types of bacteria in chemical warfare with each other. But a new paper published this week points to another source uh, of constantly battling microbes, our guts. Tell us about this. Okay. So, yeah, as Ed said, um, the search for antibiotics is sort of has looked at a lot of different what so called co- complex bacterial communities because the well the, the idea there is that well bacteria are, in, are at a constant war with each other in these communities trying to one up themselves and try to get a bit of hold on their niche and that's actually how we how a lot of antibiotics have been discovered it's just basically through seeing other microorganisms anta- antagonistic effects to their competitors um that's just that and that's how penicillin was was discovered as well, uh, essentially, like on a, you know, the old story of the agar plate and this fungus that was growing and inhibiting the growth of bacteria that Flory noticed. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is that it's very hard to grow these things um, and it's very hard to screen for them. So, and obviously the other problem is that there's there's so many different modes of resistance nowadays and we have, we're fighting a constant battle against bacteria like uh, Staph, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, um, which is re- resistant to like methicillin, which is like a, one of our deadliest antibiotics. So it's a real problem. Um, now, what these guys have done is they've sifted through human waste, basically, but they've done it in a way that they haven't relied on growing the bacteria from our guts. They've basically looked at their ge- at genetics. Um, they've just, as far as I can tell, they've got databases and databases of genes that have been randomly sequenced from human guts. A lot of these are bacteria, most of these are bacteria actually. And they've gone and looked for what they think might be large proteins that may be antibiotics. So they've gone in with a sort of a preconceived notion, okay, well, we're looking for genes that we, yeah, you because know, most genes have a certain structure. Like we know what most genes will look like if they encode, for example, enzymes that, you know, um, uh, break down certain products. So we, we can kind of predict what these things will look like. And that's what they've done here. And they've looked for these genes that might be antibiotic genes, and they found a few. And they actually, they dubbed them hummomycin A and hummomycin B. So they found two that they've reported here. They think they come from a certain kind of bacteria that they can't really grow very well because it seems to bear a, a similar kind of structure. Right. But they've got the DNA sequence, and they, they, they can synthesize that in vitro, mm-hmm. just in cell lines, which is really cool. Um, you know, you basically bypass all the growing problems, and that's really cool. Obviously, you don't know what you've okay. got. So, sort of synthetically yep. producing that mm-hmm. uh, chemical, then. Yes. Okay. Not, well, the, yeah. The the um. I think they're how am I? So I think yeah, it must be a chemical. But anyway, um. So they then use these in vivo in a, a mouse model. They infected mice with um, MRS. How do you say it again? M- <laughs> MRS. MRSA. MRSA, methyl- methicillin resistant staph aureus, which is yeah, golden staph, one of the worst um resistant bugs out there like it causes once you've got it it's like well now now you're screwed because we don't know what to do mm. they infected mice with these bacteria they then dosed them with either a normal beta lactam beta lactam drug like penicillin which this bug is resistant to doesn't has no problem just gets rid of it um mm. then they then they treated it with this new hummomycin they got a fairly good success rate um i think let's have a look i think um not all of them died. A few of them died, but not all of them. But then when they actually mixed the two together, this beta-lactam, you know, the old-style beta-lactam antibiotic and this mm-hmm. new antibiotic, 100% success rate. They stopped Whoa. the infection. And what they think is happening is that, because well, so this new drug seems to work on, a, on, a, on an enzyme called a flipase, which is essentially it's a, a, a lipid-2 flipase. And what, what I think this enzyme does is it facilitates movements of lipids across the membrane. So it basically builds membranes. And if you take that out, you've ruined the bacteria's ability to create, maintain its lipid membrane. 
And then okay. when you hit it with the beta lactam, which is also another lipid, <laughs> another lipid blocking antibiotic, it's weakened mm-hmm. already, so it finishes it off. So okay. it's kind of a um, it's kind of a double whammy kind of effect. So it, it kind yeah. of undoes that resistance uh, and allowing it the older style of beta lactam to doesn't do, do it its usual damage. Doesn't undo it because beta lactam beta lactam resistance provides attacks. another avenue then for yeah, the beta lactam right. to I mean, work. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about beta lactam beta lactam antibiotics is they're easily the reason uh, the way bugs overcome this is by encoding an enzyme called a beta lactamase, which basically breaks down the antibiotic. So they can still mm-hmm. do that, except that I think their ability to do so has been weakened by the activity of the very first enzyme, a uh, first antibiotic, which essentially stops lipids from being produced properly in the first place. Okay. So it's 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 really cool. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if they did. I'm not really quite sure if they did this as a as, as a thought experiment. Like, you know, if this works, we can do it this way. And you know, uh, I'm not sure what their thinking was, or if it was just you know, we'll just see what happens. We'll just try these different antibiotic um, mixes and see what happens. But they've come across a, what looks to be a fairly effective treatment. Well, and- my understanding was they basically did this as kind of a proof of concept, saying that we can look at other gut bugs and we can find yeah. other antibiotics this way and this is a, a method of discovery which is pretty cool mm, yeah and what is cool is that they've done it without the need for old school methods like growing bacteria and screening mm. them, figuring out where yeah so it's if this works if, if they could m- mine other databases like this and, and and this doesn't just have to apply to bugs i mean you could do the same thing to them you know, to the, to the millions of millions of bases of DNA sequences of like marine bacteria that we've got in databases mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. soil or whatever. Same principle. If you can, cool. you know, synthesize a gene from a, a synthesize a product from a you know gene in a database. Yeah, this is the way to do it. So, Very yeah. cool. All right, let's move on to space. And Lucas, we've now got all the data back from the New Horizons probe and its flyby of Pluto. And while oh, scientists it? will be Oh, I didn't know. I thought, yeah, pretty sure a month or two ago we got it all. Okay. Oh, cool. Don't quote me that. I'll, I'll have to check up on that. But, sure that's right, yeah. I saw that. But it's still going to take, you know, years to crunch over all that data and there's always going to be different angles and ways of looking at it. But one exciting discovery was announced this week. Turns out underneath the famous heart shape on Pluto, there could be a subsurface ocean, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and uh, this is um, this has been posed sort of a little while ago but but uh there seems to be more mounting evidence for this and a lot of it comes down to the the um relationships of things which is just you know one of the ongoing themes for me in in uh in astronomy and 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 physics just how they can extrapolate out from what we do know and and build a picture it's 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 very cool what we're talking about here of course is uh, as you say that sort of heart shape or as was very famously depicted when uh new horizons got its first high-res photo sent back uh, it had a picture of you know pluto the dog sort of overlaid over it very 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 well you know on a particular angle so that's that's still what i see whenever i see um, uh, the the uh, plenum which uh, so yeah so so it was it was it was known as uh, sputnik uh, plenum originally it's now been um it's received its final name of sputnik Plenitia. Plenitia? Plenitia? I, I can't pronounce it but anyway it's it now has a name that's harder to say. Uh, <laughs> so that's its formal name now. So this this particular area, it's believed, was uh, the result of an impact of some sort. So something maybe, you know, a, a, a couple of hundred kilometres wide smacked into uh, into Pluto at some point in its past and, uh, and produced quite a large impact crater. Now... The key here is that this impact crater is actually on a path, a very important path, which is di- uh, directly opposite where Pluto and Charon orbit each other. In there. They're tightly locked, so basically they show the same face to each other all the time. So the face of Pluto that's presented to Charon is actually directly opposite this, this heart-shaped you know, field. Which is interesting in and of itself, because if you put two objects in this type of orbit where they're tidally locked, the the more uh, the the greater mass of of, uh, of the objects will tend to settle on those opposite parts of the orbit. Because if you picture them orbiting a common centre of gravity, 
the the you know the heavier uh, parts of them will tend to be on the outside, which is where where mm-hmm. this is. If you had one object, say you had just a a ball that was slightly weighted on one side, like even a something like a a, a basketball can can have this effect because of the the valve on it, you know, where you you actually mm-hmm. put the the needle through to to blow up the basketball. It's slightly heavier on the side, you know, that that because there's a little bit more concentrated plastic there. So if you get something like that and you spin it, it will eventually settle so that the the thicker part or the the more massive part will end up at the equator the the you know it'll it'll be spinning mm-hmm. right at the equator so it's you have two objects like this. Yeah. yeah exactly and and so that's what they think may may have happened here with with pluto they think that over time this impactor uh, event has created a crater which has then filled with Basically, uh, very saline uh, water, or maybe mixed with with a like a strong chemical mix that's that's acting as an antifreeze, keeping it sort of in a slushy sort of state, which we've discussed in the past with you mm-hmm. know with regard to moons like Ganymede and so forth around Jupiter, uh, which we also suspect have this kind of slushy you know ocean under under the surface, unlike Europa and and uh, Enceladus that we think have actually got liquid in certain parts, um, in in the case. Of, uh, of this uh, uh, planet, well, dwarf planet, we think it's probably a slushy sort of scenario, and, and that's largely due to the fact that there's really no great source of heat to keep anything in a liquid state out there. Um, you know, we, we don't, we're not talking about tidal forces like we would be with Jupiter that are sort of compressing the crust and, and, and producing heat. Mm-hmm. Here, we, we're really only relying on the radioactive decay. So um, one of the teams have actually done a lot of calculations about that, and they reckon that um, uh, there is sufficient radioactive decay potentially within Pluto after all of this time since its formation that it could harbour a subsurface ocean in that sort of slushy state, perhaps about 200 kilometres deep, as in the ocean itself would be about 200 kilometres deep of this sort of slushy scenario. And yeah, so so if it did have this, and and, and where this, this, you know, what this story is ultimately about is all of these pieces of evidence are starting to line up that that underneath uh, the Sputnik plenum, I'm just going to refer to its older name because I can say it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> underneath the plenum is, is uh, which, which is look, look stunning, by the way, if you haven't seen the photos, some of the high-res photos of the the surface of this thing, you can see those very like what you'd see on Earth, basically great big pancakes of ice sitting you know next to each other like plates, and they they rubbing up against this mountainous region. It looks really cool, mm. and it's quite a signature sort of thing of ice. It's that pancake ice that tends to form you know in the Arctic regions on on the surface of our salty oceans. It it, it forms in small clumps and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then ice is over. Um, so and, that and so that. So that ice on Pluto is probably nitrogen ice, is it, or is it? Yeah, actual... so they think the surface is nitrogen because what we what we are seeing right. on a, a fairly recent uh, basis is a is a sort of convection uh, convection process that's taking place, and they think that the convection process is at parts of of um, Pluto's elliptical orbit when it beca- when it does get closer to the sun, they think that the um, uh, the ice, the nitrogen ice, is basically sublimating directly and then refreezing. So it's 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 acting a little bit like a glacier would act in 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 that glaciers mm-hmm. are restocked by falling snow, so this is how they think this this ice is kind of being repaved constantly, which is why it's such a new surface. That yeah, we're, looking right. at. we're not so seeing smooth and covered in. Yeah. Exactly, we're not seeing a whole lot of um, impact craters and so forth that you would expect to see out there. So the underwater, oh, the, sorry, the underwater ocean. Here's a word for you: the subsurface <laughs> ocean, though. Yes. Is that- Water, water, or no. is that also liquid nitrogen? No, well, yes. Or, or we don't Sorry, know. okay. <laughs> yes, no, no. Um, basically, <laughs> the uh, what what lines up would be um, water, uh, either a very like a Dead Sea type mix of very saline, very salty water, or even mixed mm-hmm. in with things like ammonia, which would act as a as like a, an antifreeze, which is entirely feasible in the right. in the chemical composition of the planet. But they think it then has this nitrogen layer over the top, this this frozen nitrogen. It's not just nitrogen either. There's a whole lot of other very common um, sort of um, volatiles that are that are frozen in uh, that, that they've picked up through New Horizons mission. Still, um, but what's what? But, but um, even if it is hypersaline and with all these other chemicals, that's still liquid water. That's still pretty. That's correct. Impressive and yeah, you know, potentially useful one day if we were to colonize the outer rim, sort of thing. Oh that's yeah, I mean a lot of the water a lot of the um, reactions life. of other astronomers who have commented on this have been 
That is just incredibly cool. I mean, to think that there could be liquid water this in this sort of environment is yeah. mind blowing, because it it does it does present a whole lot of opportunities down the track. But you know, just looking at this story and in, on its own merits, the 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 reason they've come to this is just because of this gravitational interaction that's taking place. If you did have an impactor which effectively makes a crater, yeah, you've got less mass in a crater. So you know, the impactor should have left less mass than what was there before. But there's also a slight rebound effect that occurs when something does hit. So you would then get a little bit of material deposited back into the crater but still it would be you know an aggregate of less than what was there originally so what they're proposing is that this liquid ocean has come in and filled the crater and because there's a crater there that the the ocean because liquid water is more dense than ice remember when you freeze Mm. water it becomes less dense and that's one of the signature things about water ice that's why we're talking about water here um, and not other things. So it's kind of really cool. It's basically they reckon something smacked it, uh, left a crater, uh, liquid water um, filled that crater, and then was covered by a layer of nitrogen, ice, and other other types of chemicals. But that liquid has stayed a kind of a semi-liquid, you know, somewhere like that slushy sort of consistency underneath, mm. and that has given it that extra mass, which has caused it to then settle opposite the the face that that presents to Sharon with its with its shared orbit. Which which is just really, really cool. And as I said, that's, that's it's that cool. sort of joining of the dots that I really, really love. And, and they're, they're saying, look, at the moment, they really can't think of anything else that would cause this because, you know, they, they're definitely looking at what appears to be a, an impact crater. There's no, no real doubt about that. But, you know, what else could explain what this is when they are definitely seeing ice formation on this, you know, that sort of pancake ice that I mentioned mm. before. So, and yeah, that it's... locked position with Sharon. Yes. Right? Dead on axis locking thing is also another evidence uh, for that's that. That's the key. Very, very. That's cool. that's really the key. It's it's the the orbital resonance and the fact that it's settled on that opposite side, which is really leading them to the conclusion that there is gr- a greater amount of mass concentrated in that area. And this will happen, you know, like if we saw, for example, you know, fast forward Earth uh, if a few millennia uh, and we have, you know, continued movement of the continental plates and subduction zones and all that sort of stuff. If you if you end up with a, a great mountain range forming, it, it, it does actually affect the um, uh, the spin of the Earth. That's, that's you know, the Earth could end up, you know, tilting over on its side compared to where it is now in terms of its axial spin. So that happens. And just to... To follow up, it was on October 25th uh, that they got the last bit of data back from New Horizons, all 6.25 gigabytes of data. So Wow. So, that's yeah, they cool really well. did have a similar sort of um, broadband to me at home. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Take you 15 months to download that much, yeah. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. Yep. <laughs> well, that's our show then. It was a quick show, but a cool show. It was a short and sweet. Yeah. Of course, you can get more information on all those stories at scienceontop.com slash 248. And you can also find all the ways to get in touch with us there as well. And if you like the show, why not tell some friends? Hopefully you get them listening as well. Thank you for joining me today, Shane, Penny and Lucas. Thank you, Ed. No worries. Thank Thanks, you. Ed. This episode was edited with a sense of jocular profundity by Marcos Benamou. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. As a cosmologist, I see the world as a whole, and I am here to address one of the most serious public health problems of the 21st century. Today too many people die from complications related to overweight and obesity. We eat too much, and move too little. Fortunately, the solution is simple. More physical activity, and change in diet. It's not rocket science. And for what it's worth, how being sedentary has become a major health problem is beyond my understanding.